And here I am, doing the one thing all cool that battle chants do. As of the time I'm recording this, the future of the show looks uncertain to positive at the moment. So I pray and hope that I don't upload this next to some bad news that will make this video somewhat awkward. But I decide to stay optimistic and trust that we're currently either in the same bubble of positive uncertainty or better, and not worse. If you're new to this channel, hi, I'm Ark of Krypton. I reviewed and ranked all of that battle season 10, thoroughly loved it, and I plan to deliver some more Dead Battle stuff while we wait for updates, so subscribe to not miss out. Back on this ranking, the usual disclaimer that this is all just my opinion. So without further ado, let's get into some honorable mentions first, aka matchups that I'm pretty sure I want as much as the next person does, but not to the point of considering them on my personal list. If there's a famous Dead Battle matchup, or even some underrated ones really, or even some underrated ones really, there's a good chance I like it as much as you do, person watching at home. And if that's not the case, well, I hope you can still be friends. And I hope you can forgive me for beating ya into what's actually a top 11, haha! <laughs> Did I not see you before? <laughs> You're dead! Wookie, wookie, wookie. Consider this a bonus entry of sorts, since it's characters that have already been on the show. And it's a double one to boot. That battle picking up combatants with a shared team allows for each character to channel it in their own different ways. But what if a character has multiple layers to them to channel? Well, here's what this double pick is for. That being Omniman vs Bardock and SCP-682 vs Doomsday. While I love Omnilander and Oxday as episodes, as I feel like they channel Omniman evil super manliness and Doomsday raging fury against Omnilander and Orc respectively very nicely. However, starting with Bardock Man, yeah, you're gonna hear a lot of crossover ships names here. <laughs> Saiyans and Viltrumites are obvious picks for a matchup, since both are proud risks of flying brick conquerors, and the same goes for the two warriors that turn against their respective empires. Bardock was Omniman's most requested opponent and I still think is the best one overall, sharing the old father motif too. The idea of either arriving to the Order's outpost in attempts to conquer it, maybe with fellow Saiyans and slash or Viltrumites fighting in the background, just goes hard man. I know Flying Bricks matchups can often sound uninteresting, but I feel like Only Man's skill and might against Bardock's energy attacks would make for a nice dynamic. And in general, this episode would happen once we got to know Only Man's more redeemed himself in the animated series too, so it's not just capitalizing on a surface level trend, you know? For the longest time, I thought Only Man won this one too, but apparently Composite Bardock is a plant buster even without going Super Saiyan, so good for you, bye bye. Doomsday vs SCP-682 honestly speaks for itself. Two life-hating creatures covered in bone armor with the ability to adapt to any attempt at forcing them to death's doorstep. Basically two kids constantly making up rules about their imaginary powers so that they always come up on top. What fully solidified my love for this fight is the death battle cast with the imaginary axis, quite possibly the best one they ever did and I 1% recommend checking it out. The real conclusion I gathered is that these two would fight, adapt and kill each other till the very end of time, with 6A2 being the only one of the two being able to survive that. That alone falls into the genre of hilarious but goes out as fuck stuff that I love wholeheartedly. But there's also stuff like 6A2 being so much smarter and his existence just existing on a level beyond the very concept of consciousness apparently making Doomsday attempt to infect it with the mind virus just moot, especially since 682 would just assimilate it into himself and gain a new fancy set of spikes. Another thing I love about the 682's day is that it can start as small as a lab in a SCP facility to go bigger than the universe itself, especially with 682 2 form. So yeah, I honestly would be equally happy with either of these, with a wee bit of an edge on 682's day though. I really need to see the bastard that killed countless supermen and orc suffer. Please and thank you. Your elemental power is... Green. What's that? Green. Okay. Green. Okay, you know I had to sneak in a joke episode. And to tell you the truth, I never realized how similar Shrek and Kazuma are. They're both snarky, green cortex, stuck in fantasy stories that these satirically subvert almost every corner of that being fairy tales and isekais respectively, acting as a straight man to the eccentric cast of characters they're surrounded by, after being forcefully dragged away from their sedentary lifestyles by outside factors. Even their generally laid-back, snarky, cynical and short-tempered personality are a match made in heaven, which is again honestly two layers for me not to mention. In terms of contrast, there would be the obvious magic and bow versus brawn and farts, and Kazuma's luck might seem like a huge advantage. But if you bring in the stuff Bookshrek does, 
on top of all the games this franchise has an interesting amount of, I feel like you can get surprisingly wild with it. I would say this fight would ideally be sprite, honestly, since they nailed the last DreamWorks character in that art style with no problem. And it would also allow for the more animated Endron bits to fit Kazuma's style. I can see Kazuma starting the fight in an attempt to slay the ogre for some easy XP, only to find out a way more difficult than he'd think, with Shrek snarking all the way through like with every annoying chatterbox he comes across. Not to mention the music this fight could have. Mixing together any of the Konosuba intros with Smash Mouth? Are you kidding me? This battle to me screams every letter of the word fun. Your final service. Let's hope go to your phone. Time for a total tunnel shift. Yeah, David Tepp vs Kyoko Kirikiri is honestly in the same ballpark as Walter vs Light in terms of haha funny meme matchup, but if you actually think about it, it can go hard as fuck. It's a battle between two high ranking detectives chasing after a master schemer who just loves death games, obsessing with ending their legacy at any cost. This bit I just mentioned could honestly make for a perfect setup already for the fight. Having either Billy or Monokuma, or dreadfully enough to imagine both, sending a TV message to Kyoko and David as they wake up bound and chained. The fight, while grounded, can incorporate quite a lot of elements, such as their stealth, intelligence, gun expertise, puzzle solving, and given the surprisingly compatible franchises, lots of blood spreading and limb staring. With the tone going from spooky to intense, gory, or even emotional. I once read a comment on Reddit suggesting an ending where Tap ultimately succumbs to wounds from the fight or traps, but not before digging into his guts to give Kyoko the key to escape, with a silent nod of approval as she begrudgingly takes it and leaves. Yeah, you'll come to find that I love some tragedy in my battles. Also, any Dengar Wapa matchup is an immediate banger for the music potential, but when mixing any of them with Hello Zap, they just take my money. This is not the last time you see get Dengar Wapa on this list either, so stay tuned. Do you like squeaky toys? Took out the guy. <laughs> Animal vs Animal is probably the earliest form of fight debate most people get into. I remember back in elementary school wondering who would win between a grizzly bear and a gorilla. Loki still do, but I digress. And while I am 1% against actual examples happening on the show, not because I'm against arming hypothetical animals, but because I just kinda find it in bad taste, not gonna lie, Wiz. There is a creature vs creature matchup that perfectly taps into the gorilla vs gorilla part of my brain without harming anyone's sensitivities or imaginary animals. Celebrating Alien Romulus when Stranger Things final season, we have Xenomorph vs Demogorgon, or Xeno vs Demogorgon friends. Just feels like a great matchup between the sci-fi of back then and the sci-fi of nowadays. Faceless monster from deep space vs faceless extra-dimensional abomination. I can see them getting some body horror in there with civilian casualties, have fun with portals, or demos that resulting in a chest buster with a starfish shaped mouth. Oh come on! You gotta admit this is cool! The battle could happen within a ship somehow crash landing in the upside down, with the mind player sending a demo to investigate, and the battle breaks out between the two creatures. I don't know why, but I have this weird feeling that they would do a better job compositing two species with many variations at once, rather than just one with an established character. And there's a game with a perfectly usable 3D models for both to use, so hey, it's free real estate for 3D animators. And a free payday for voice actors, since you know, they don't talk you can just recycle screeches and words and such. From what I got, the Xeno should win based on higher speed and acidic blood, on top of being generally much smarter. But funnily enough, I saw someone else online pointing out that Xeno having so much more material is actually detrimental to his chances of winning, since they found so many different ways to kill these things that we basically know all of its biggest weaknesses, whereas we honestly know very little about them of physiology. Even with that though, in space, no one can hear your expectations being flipped upside down. Subscribe for more deeply intelligent and hysterical wordplay like this one. If you're happy and you know it, <laughs> damn, y'all depressed as fuck. There's legacy matchups, and then there's this one. Nine years in the making. Jesus. <laughs> Although I want to believe this matchup has more of a, say, relevance power over call it. No offense. Still love the percentage of you that wasn't the analysis, buddy. This is a battle between not quite old school, but not quite modern either, tragic anime protects, who got caught in a war between humans and monsters becoming and embracing their monster side as they go down a darker path. Although taking different paths to obtain peace for their kind, 
and having a lot of body horror transformation to go through, including rather gigantic ones. This may sound a bit weird, but I actually can imagine this battle being the weird offspring between Cole vs Alex and Gojo vs Makima, aka amazingly animated sprites and hand-drawn stuff, a good dynamic of bouncing power sets, a hero vs villain type of storytelling, with Ken being horrified of his monster's side and wanting peace for both human and monster, while Eren is perfectly ready to become an irredeemable monster to destroy his enemies. Also, yes, the irony of Ken having a form bigger than any Titan in Attack on Titan, the Dragon Ghoul reaching 20 kilometers to be exact, is quite amusing. Speaking of, most of the fights I will discuss in this video from now on all have an, an element of army battles that could happen in the background of the main fight, but come on, a war clash between Titans and Ghouls? Come on, you can not not want that. Speaking of, what you're seeing on screen right now is an amazing storyboarded fight by Mazuk Sanderson. You should definitely check it out, it's extremely underrated. Link in the description. I can honestly see some emotional dialogue potential coming into play too, such as Ken trying to reach out to Eren about their similar traumas, maybe defending a human city from the rumbling, that all sounds really cool. I once saw a comment on Reddit about Eren and Ken both having this motif of quote, moving forward, except the former uses it as a coping mechanism to not face the weight of his actions, while the latter uses it as a way to not lose himself in trauma and mistakes of its past. If that doesn't scream a potential for a scene a la Gats vs Dimitri where they both scream I must keep moving forward, except with different tones and motivations behind it, god I'm honestly just getting chills just thinking about it. I mean, with Obi Vader being my honestly my favorite episode of all time, you can't expect me to not fall for emotional potential between characters caught in the strings of tragedy, negative character arcs, broken dreams and redemption. Oh yeah, in terms of the debate, again, I have honestly no idea. Though I am leaning more towards Kaneki. Apparently Kent's colossal form makes him a bit of a Tetsuo situation, so Eren could take the W in a similar fashion to Magneto, even though it would be a darker ending, but my preferred scenario would be Ken regaining some humanity at the very end, be it in his last moments or as he mourns the kindred soul he just killed. Oh, and did I mention the amazing music potential? Ending for Attack on Titan, preferably the rumbling, mixed with Unravel, I swear I'm imagining an orgasm right now. Unraveled Pathos is great too, for reference. So yeah, honestly I love this matchup the more I talk about it, and I cannot think of a good pun between Ghoul and Titans, so just move on. Dang, I should have said move forward. It's just an Being the last Marvel vs DC fight that I actually care about, featuring my favorite DC villain of all time, I gotta be honest, I'm not as head of wheels as I once was about Mysterio vs Scarecrow. But the potential for creativity with all their illusions, gadgets, psychological stuff, fakeouts and whatnot are all undeniably still there. Similar to Gojo vs Makima, the debate of it all just makes it so much more fun. On one hand, Mysterio's helmet protects him from Scarecrow Fear Toxin. Then Scare Beast coming into play, smashing Mysterio to a pulp. Then you remember Quentin technically doesn't even need to be present thanks to his robotic decoys, then you bring Yellow Lantern Scarecrow into play, and honestly I can see both winning, depending on what you give to who. Mysterious illusions don't stop at fear alone, making him technically more versatile, but Scarecrow actually delves into end-to-end -end combat and is pretty adept with the sight, and you get my point. The personality clash would definitely be fun too, such as having Quentin's theatrical drama mixing with Jonathan's general creepiness, much like his Arkham Knight self reacts to Riddler. I know what you're doing, Crane. You're appealing to my ego. Is it working? Ha! I don't have an ego, Crane. I'm far too brilliant. Speaking of, I love if they use this version first, then use the Injustice 2 model for the Scabies form. Come on, it would literally be perfect. The two best character design in one battle. Maybe you can even model the voice after the DCAU self from the new Batman Adventures. That would be just the cherry on top. Apparently there's even models for Mysterio's MCU self, so hey, that's great, just use that, no problems here. No clue what the music track would be like, but if there is anything this matchup lacks, is his imagination. Well, would you look at that? This is the matchup that leaves the fabric of space time fully untouched. Huh, why in the odds? That topic, the more time passes, the more I have, uh, let's say, interesting relationships with uh, A Train vs. Idatenia, since A Train seems to evolve closer and closer to a redemption arc in the show. 
Despite the starting appeal for this matchup, being Tenya showing this narcissistic asshole what a real evil is like. I'm pretty sure they can circumvent this problem by giving A Train a season 1 to 2 characterization, since they would composite him with his much more morally abhorrent comic book self anyway. The core team is that they're both relatively grounded blue speedsters with an engineering team the hero codenames. Part of a superhero team is led by an all American team blonde whom both deeply care for their older brother. The contrast, which I also believe to be a good way to start the fight, is out there on the polar opposites of the superhero responsibility spectrums. I even read a fan made script where the fight started due to A Train almost running into someone without apologizing, then Tanya follows him in order to get that apology, which escalates in A Train pushing Tanya at super speeds towards innocent people, limiting all on him with no care for accountability whatsoever, only for Tanya to finally realize that A Train is no hero at all, putting him down for good. I even imagine as something as serious as the fight ending with Tenya bringing himself to the authorities after killing A Train. In case it wasn't clear, yes, I do believe A Train will face the same fate as Homelander the last time he was in the show, dying by the hands of a much more straightforward superhero character. But again, with A Train new characterization, maybe they can bring a whole new dynamic to this fight. They can surprise me. Top all of that with the potential they have for the banter and their contrasting personalities aka modest hero vs glory seeking asshole, with some fast paced action alongside gut wrenching collateral damage and got yourself a pretty great matchup with lots of potential to go off the rails. What killed the dinosaurs? It was me, Barry. So, your boy grew up with Cartoon Network. Not Boomerang, nor Nickelodeon, but Cartoon Network. So growing up with the likes of Courage and Scooby Doo made it pretty difficult for me to imagine for, or for a death battle episode where I am more well versed in both than this one. That is, until Aku vs Lich came along. This battle between primordial evils, inspired by East and West fantasy respectively, who keep coming back in spite of being defeated by pure dead swordsmen, also counts as a 2000 CNN vs 2010 CNN, on top of being polar opposites on the how funny is your villain compared to the setting and story scale, which alone would make for amazing chemistry but we'll get to that later. And funnily enough, they both reached existential depression once they returned in their respective Adult Swim revivals. Not sure if that was meta commentary or not. Also, they both canonically killed the dinosaurs. I'm like, what do you say fuck me for? This fight is honestly the unholy spawn of Bill vs Discord and Lich King vs Sauron for me, following a comic relief villain versus a much darker one with lots of magical overlordiness involved, albeit with a cartoony brush all over it. The banter potential between the clashing personalities alone sells me on this matchup, but honestly so does the debate between their sheer versatility. On one hand, Aku is a mortal, can infinitely shapeshift and regenerate, and send people throughout time when he doesn't want to deal with them, you know, like a little bitch. Lich can seemingly mind control anyone, regenerate just as much, control magic hellfire, and scales in second place to the godlike orb. In terms of an unkillability, I should have honestly sprinkled a bit of Scooby Courage in there, because like, how would they hurt, let alone kill each other, I have honestly no idea. I do know that the fight potential is amazing. Lich trying to mentally attack Aku only for him to duplicate himself and shape shift into a laser shooting Barracuda, I don't know, <laughs> or have a classic fire clash, hellfire vs laser, move the fight throughout space and time with respective powers, have Lich put Aku's entire army to sleep, or even, if Lich wins, have him possess Aku and somehow turn his dystopia into an evil shitty place to live in, since, you know, you will not be living anymore, period. I actually once saw this gut-wrenching fan art of Lich fighting inside of Jack's body, possessing his corpse, much like when he possessed Billy. That concept alone is honestly as soul-crushing for Jack as this character acted for Lich. But I'm pretty sure the sword not reacting well to Lich's essence would make Aku raise his flaming eyebrow for a second. Yet funny enough, if Aku wins, he would probably end the fight like Dio taking the W but left with nightmares for the rest of his life. Or maybe something like Yeah, that was kinda weird, but we're back in the club. Human work. Uh, yeah, I sure hope it Human work! Despite some hiccups early on, that battle has shown over the years to truly get the hang on pacifist characters. N no Okay. Quite a tricky endeavor given the very premise of the show. So you would have every right to ask how the hell would a battle between Marcus and Caesar unfold? Well, to be honest, 
Unless you wanna go for a big misunderstanding route, I'm pretty sure you would kinda have to, to go with aggressive revolutionary Marcus, sort of the reverse of when they used Hero Call for the fight against Alex. That is honestly the only unfortunate hiccup in a matchup that I otherwise believe has all the potential to be cinematic, dramatic, tragic, grounded, yet surprisingly debatable. Let's get the obvious core team first. Non-human yet sentient beings treated as subhuman yet raised by a kind man, before evolving into the revolutionary leaders of their kind after spreading their X Factor to them, starting an uprising. They also occasionally butt heads with team members that have more, let's say, pessimistic ideas on mankind. Which brings us back to our already amazing dialogue potential these two could have. And of the rival Silver Hunter, honestly. They could have their different armies fight in the background, which come on, has to be in a snowy setting, not to mention the music potential, man. When I tell you that I want to bawl my eyes out from crying, man. <laughs> Regarding who would win, again, it's surprisingly debatable, because on one hand, Marcus is a pretty tough android with a decision simulator in his head, but Caesar is vastly more agile and experienced, especially in dealing with human foes, outdoing them to sheer creativity. Surprisingly enough, they should be dead even in physical strength for my account, being both able to bend metal and lightly toss humans around like salad. You have no idea how weird that is for a death battle matchup. I can honestly see both Caesar taking the L, since you know, Marcus can keep on going being a machine, just as much as I can see Caesar laying a precise headshot, since you know, a shot to the head is a shot to the head, regardless of the color of your blood. This has been your anti racism PSA for the day. Also, you know, more movie slash video game representation is always nice. And this list has been pretty dry of both. So far, at least. Stay in the box! No! Stay in the box! No! Get out of my skin! Villain vs. Villain is not only one of the best concepts in fiction, period, but also one of the best genres of death battle, period, if not the. And East vs. West happens to be, as this video probably made abundantly clear by now, also one of my personal favorites. There's a very beloved episode that fits both criteria. And yeah, to cut it short, Sukuna vs Zuske would be to me what Goku Black vs Reverse Flash is to many. I know, I know, Ben 10 and Jujutsu Kaisen are quite the combination, even with the former having its shonen influence and occasional nightmare fuel. Well, Zuske is kinda like the figurehead of the latter, and is an honestly very underrated villain that definitely deserves some spotlight, the non-harmful kind at least. The core team he has with Sukuna is that they're both evil, ancient overlords whose minds still reside in small parts on themselves, DNA strands and fingers respectively, with these parts falling into the hands of young teenage heroes that thought they could have been used for good, only to find a deeply arrogant, sadistic and possessive under every definition of the term sociopath who loves to traumatize them while chilling in their subconscious, for that time they stay in there anyway. Also, it turns out they're both as angry on the outside as they are inside. Between his martial arts, slicey dicey attacks and fire arrows, Sukuna already brings a ton of fun anim fight animation potential, that I think could mesh really well with, with Zuzke's sight, claws and ironically more esoteric power sets such as intangibility, telekinesis, freaking laser beams and general mental evasion the effect would give in and Sukuna the Ibijibis. A good chunk of Suki's power set would funnily enough not work on this alien, who just happens to resemble a spirit, as the skill actually lacks cursed energy, or life force honestly. Think of it as Lex Luthor's arsenal of Kryptonite being great against Kryptonians, but less so for everyone else. Sukuna could potentially damage him with the bright light provided by Fuga's fire arrows, but unless they can match the power of a dwarf star, nah. Ecturnerites being able to survive on even a few strands of DNA, aka molecular level, really fucks Sukuna over. <laughs> this is just a fun piece of world building, yet for power scaling, it's a lot. <laughs> just ask Cole vs Alex. There are so many scenes I can picture for this fight. Like Sukuna's trying his classic face grab only for Zuzuke to face to the floor and grab him with his tail to do the head bash move, Zuzuke using telekinesis to send pillars at Sukuna as he melts to them like in his fight with Jogo, Zuzuke turning people into Ecturnerites so that Sukuna's opponents he can judo his way through instead of being no cell by intangibility, the fight taking place in the Shubuya train station giving both lots of stuff to break and, and collateral deaths to cause, 
another parallel with reverse flash on Goku Black, Sukuna grabbing Zosuke's side with his throat mouth, what that mouth do? The final clash having Zosuke somehow end up in space, getting powered up by the darkness of it, as he shoots a big laser beam that's about to be sliced by Sukuna wall slash from below, and the power to literally enter a possessed person and kill the possessor so that the original host can gain control, which honestly makes me think this fight is a matchup made in heaven, just points towards Zosuke winning in my book. Also, Zosuke has spared people before, so I hope he lets go of Yuji after the fight, though I doubt it. There's this fan comic I saw on Reddit that showcases a chilling moment that could happen in the fight. If I find it, if I found it, you'll see as a screen right now, but it's just great, really. These two mesh so well together, it's insane. Couple of that with a mashup of You Are My Special and an ominous version of the Ben 10 Classic team, and you have a matchup that has a ghost of a chance to not stand among kings. Give it up for these two cursed freaks. And to the surprise of, uh, I would hope, absolutely no one who's been watching my channel ever since I started doing that battle stuff, William Afton vs Junko Enoshima is my favorite matchup of all time. It's the first matchup I ever made a trailer for, most successful too, and clearly, since I can humbly say I, I cooked with, with that one. There are so many similarities between these two, you could honestly think William took a trip to Japan that ended in his uh, essence staying there. Both him and Junko are irredeemable criminal masterminds for point and click games, responsible for plot starting tragedies, defined by the total lack of empathy, calculating schemes, sadistic behavior, and dramatic yet oddly charismatic sense of showmanship, enough to make Joker proud. Yes, I know, it is a popular matchup as well, but I really don't like it, sorry Chief. Not to mention hiding their identities behind kid friendly animal mascots their obsession with the spur and agony respectively, to the point of constant self-sabotage and destruction, returning from the grave as body snatching AIs that technically aren't even 1% them, honestly fuck it, I'm just gonna make the connection scroll by as I speak from just how much I love them. I just find it so beautiful that East and West can come up with such eerily similar and just perfectly compatible characters, like a bond between space and time of sorts. This is honestly why I love East and West matchups in general, in case you were wondering. But enough sappy talk about connections, what about contrast? Well, right off the bat, I love how they're both complete monsters, but only William happens to look like one, currently at least. And most of all, they completely contrasting views on dying, with William being utterly terrified to the point of shifting from serial killer to mad scientist to achieve immortality, whereas Junko is so twisted and demented that she actually looks forward to her own death and despair meaning that the undead serial killer rabbit ironically ends up being the more human of the two in this regard, kinda like how in Freezer vs Megatron, Megatron was somehow the worm of the two despite being a machine, although obviously with much less sympathy involved in this regard. The animation slash fight slash banter potential can honestly go in so many places, spring trap speed crawling to the vents as Junko monitor the cameras in general confusion to what the fuck she's seeing, William entering the scene in a way that mirrors the film, Junko's personality is clashing with William's British snark, something involving Afton either corrupting or straight up throwing arcades, Junko's monokumas demolishing Afton's animatronics, since you know, it's Chuck E. Cheese versus robots led by the teen that's been paired with the Helsing's major from how much they crave World War 3, and giving Afton his powers from the books allows for all kinds of technological mambo jumbo to take place, be it him corrupting Junko's monokumas against her, his giant agony form clashing with a giant Monokuma piloted by Junko, him absorbing tech into himself, her surprising him with the amount of weapons she brings, Junko being surprised returned by Afton's undead nature, they honestly both nothing like anything they have seen in their own worlds, so that alone opens the door for all kinds of fun reactions. So while Junko from my understanding is better at manipulation and analysis, Afton literally came up with sentient AI in the 80s in his universe whereas Junko piggybacks on the, on the one she uses, built by others. So you could say that in this category, Junko took a shortcut, whereas Afton took the short circuit. <laughs> you might wanna jam in the fact that he discovered immortality, which is again far beyond anything Junko bothered to research. Are we facing another book smart versus street smart now that I think about it? Oh, that's kinda neat. Not to mention the music potential, 
date the beatness of enough soundtrack in general, like the movie Please sneaking in some the Yellow Rabbit theme in there, mixed with the techno dubstep from Dragon Europa, or with the te mechanical accents here and there, like in Dust No Moon, to signal their technological geniuses and spring trap robotic nature, Trapped in Despair is already amazing, so I can't wait to hear more. On the bad inside of things, I have honestly seen arguments for both, be it after the immortality and supernatural stuff, or Junko Vestley, Superior Arsenal and apparently stats, honestly my own wish for the outcome is that I am hoping for a scene where they both die, possibly as a result of their own choices, split screen reaction about the polar opposite reactions to it. So yeah, we're talking about a matchup with person personally everything I could ask for. Villain vs Villain, East vs West, lots of similarities with a clear contrast, a debatable outcome, and a potential in just about everything from battle to music animation. And I have no despair, no agony in admitting it. Thank you for watching and be on the lookout for more Dead Barrel content in the future or more stuff since you know I'm in other fandoms too. Doing lots of water, I'll do the same. I'm Uncle Quitton and I hope I made your day slightly better.